Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to another FS Club seminar. Today's topic is uh, an exciting one in a lot of ways. We are very privileged to have the master of the Worshipful Company of International Bankers, Karina Robinson, join us today. She's going to be talking about global trends and city effects and what this means for you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I am one of the uh, directors of Zien Group, the executive chairman, and it is my privilege to be able to host these webinars, not least because of our sponsors. Uh, we have a, a wonderful, uh, tolerant and open thinking group of sponsors. They have allowed us to range widely and freely across a number of issues. And today we're going to be discussing something dear to their hearts, as most of them are in either technology or finance. Uh, and really with Karina here, looking very much at the future of our cities and the financial services within them. Uh, before I, I hand over to Karina, who I would encourage you, her biography and things are up on the website, the URL where you registered, uh, so please do go and read those. She is going to be speaking for approximately uh, 20 to 25 minutes, and then we are going to hand over to questions. The GoToWebinar facility provides you with the ability to send questions uh, to us, which uh, we will field in approximately 20 minutes of Q&A, uh, and so I would genuinely, genuinely encourage you to, to fill those in. It should be a, a vibrant and wide-ranging discussion. Uh, but my job, as ever, is to get out of your way uh, and let you uh, chat to, to Karina. Uh, but first, Karina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. And thank you, first of all, to my dear friend, Alderman, Professor, and Sheriff, one's got to get all those titles right, Michael Manelli, for asking me to share some thoughts with you. COVID-19 and its economic effects are not going away anytime soon. We're going to be seeing a reconfiguration of our systems, ranging from geopolitical relations to the power of national governments, from company accounts to working patterns. Now, some say this new paradigm is but an acceleration of existing trends. I wouldn't disagree, but there's a point at which acceleration leads us into a new world one where we as professionals in the financial, professional, corporate sectors, we've got to change our outlook. One where the responsibilities of boards of directors, they broaden out into the wider world. And that is what I'm going to focus on today, how business has broadened out into the wider world. And for simplicity's sake, what I've done is to divide the speech into three the risk, risk or the risk committee, if you think of that for a company, nomination and remuneration committees, and the audit committee. And wait, well, risk is risk, nomination and remuneration is actually people. It's about people risk. And the audit committee is about numbers. And what I'm saying about each of these three areas, it applies equally to executives and entrepreneurs and naturally to the main boards. Now, let's deal with risk first. Black swan events. You know, it's a very famous phrase now used by author Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And, you know, it is about the totally unexpected event. And arguably, you know, this pandemic is not a totally unexpected event. Didn't Bill Gates publicly talk about how unprepared governments were for a pandemic a few years ago? We've all seen that video, which has been just gone viral now. But I don't want to quibble about definitions. What matters is that risk committees need to expand the subjects on their agenda. There are going to be other pandemics. There will be unseasonal flooding, bushfires like we've seen in Australia. Climate change isn't going away. And its effects on natural resources and economies are key. I mean, take this recent um, catastrophe in Russia, 20,000 tons, 20,000 of diesel spilled into the Norlisk River. Now, one of the theories as to why it's happened, and this being Russia, one's never really going to know, it's got to do with a thawing permafrost. And I think, you know, we've got to focus on what will be the side effects of climate change. Now, geopolitically, we are in a world of increasing nationalism and maverick leaders where the web of US-led post-war institutions are no longer fully functional. 
So where, where do you have the dialogue, the negotiating between enemies? Very difficult to see. There is no specific platform. Now, I'm going to mention only three countries. One could mention many more, but these are the main players and these are the ones one needs to look at. First one, Russia. President Putin's poll numbers are not good. COVID-19 deaths are more than the government's corrupt statistics office will reveal, and that's something the populace knows. The oil-dependent Russian economy has been battered by record low oil prices and the failure to diversify. Putin is going to need an, a distraction of some sort. This year or in 2021, another, what, a little invasion? Cutting off electricity supplies in some corner of the West? Maybe bringing out the internet in a port area. I'm referring to something that happened in the port of Rotterdam. You know, it's been done before. And the wonderful thing with the web these days is with these attacks, nobody can be utterly sure who is actually doing them. So it's not an act of war. It's what um, an interesting author has called liminal. So we can suspect it's Russia or someone else, but we will not know, and therefore it's not an act of war. So that's Russia and its problems. China, well, China is a whole different webinar. In fact, it's many. But I just want to say one thing. Under Cameron and Osborne in this country, China was our best friend. Well, that wasn't true. Now, under Trump and Boris, it turns out they're our worst enemy. That's also not true. We are dependent on China. They are dependent on us. And let's not forget that. We have to deal with them and we will have to deal with them in future. And this idea that supply chains, we want to bring them back. But can you imagine the difficulties starting up a manufacturing plant somewhere in the UK? How long is that going to take? Where do you find the people? What about the costs? You know, the idea of the new localism and make our supply chain smaller, shorter, it's a great idea, but it's going to be more difficult than you think. So Russia, China, and one hates to say this, but, you know, another risk is the US. Trump is very embattled. Winning that election in November doesn't look at all easy. Creating more division inside the US, the enemy within, that's not enough. Obviously, that's what he's doing now with, you know, walking to a church and having his uh, and having the police fire tear gas on peaceful protesters. Things like that play very well to part of his audience. But the enemy within might not win in that election. So I would expect some new narrative, some action around what he would call the enemy without new tariffs, new trade war. I can't tell you what it will be but there will be something. Rising inequality. We've dealt with the countries that are part of risk, but rising inequality is one of the biggest risks we're facing. Pope Francis, in his Urbis and Orbis Easter homily, he spoke about a dignified life. We are going to have millions and millions and millions of unemployed. Whether the U.S. unemployment rate is 13% or it's higher, there's been a bit of controversy about that, but you know, who really cares at this point? It's bound to head up vertically, as will our numbers and those of other countries. When things like, you know, the furlough regime in this country or similar regimes in other countries where the government has been supporting employees, when those go, companies aren't going to step in. How can they? They don't have the revenues. So we also have to take into account that it's not as though our economies were starting from a position of strength. There is this idea that, you know, we had full employment in much of the West. Well, I don't think zero hour contracts, no ability to save, no margin for error. That's not really full employment. We left too many people behind with globalization and automation. Reincorporating them into working society is a challenge. And if the corporate sector is not part of the problem, it's not part of the solution. Sorry, it will be seen as part of the problem if it doesn't step up. I think this is the new world we're living in. President Macron of France 
He spoke about the need to transform our capitalist societies due to their environmental and social inequality failures. We're talking about President Macron, ex-Rothschild banker, centre-right. You know, there's a lot of change going on, and one's got to be very aware of it on that risk committee or in general. I'm not going to talk about the universal basic income, um, but it is something that used to be very seen as very, very left wing, the idea of handing out money. But, you know, the reality is it's now a mainstream discussion, how it might be applied without just throwing money away for no purpose is um, is something that we're going to need to discuss because the idea of retraining and reskilling people, professionals can retrain and reskill. A lot of manual workers cannot do that and it's become obvious that they can't and they have got to be productive members of society, both for society's stability and for their own mental health. Government. Government is, um, government is going to be big, very big. It's back. After the financial crisis, the pendulum of power for financial services and banks, it swung back towards government and the regulators. Even more so now. Governments are in the ascendant at the expense of the private sector. To keep businesses like airlines going, they're going to be forced to turn the loans, the loans they've, the money they've lent to those companies into equity stakes. Because the truth is, a loan, even if at 2%, cannot be paid if you have no revenues coming, if you're at a loss. So government, even though it doesn't ideologically want to be a shareholder, they won't be able to sell those shareholdings anytime soon. They will influence how companies are run, how they will interact with their suppliers, how they will deal with their financials. The truth is, government is, I mean, dare I say it, I would say to any young person now, going out into the working world, go and work for government. You'll make some great contacts, spend four or five years there, a very exciting place to be, all sorts of new schemes, and then come to the private sector and you'll be worth a lot more. Now, we've dealt with countries, inequality, government. I mean, the biggest risk and opportunity is quantum computing. But again, that's a totally separate webinar. And I'm definitely not the right person to do that. Let's move on. The nomination and remuneration committees. People. That's what we're talking about here. People, people, people. How do you, as businesses, attract the most talented people? I'm speaking mainly to a city audience, and I can point out that we have a problem, and you're probably aware of it, and this is relevant for financial and professional services in other OECD countries. The city was where the best and the brightest in my generation headed. There was just no question about it. Now, the best and the brightest head to Google. Startups, they head NGOs, or they set up on their own. Former city minister Mark Hoban, he chaired the uh, Financial Services Skills Task Force and he found that there's a huge crisis of skills and talent in the sector. There are issues with purpose, issues with culture and not enough continuous education once you have a job and are in it so that you are being retrained the whole time. So attracting the best and the brightest is one problem, but the unemployed are also your problem. The deprived are your problem. Racism is your problem. There's no longer separation between politics and business. And if there's one thing I'd ask that you take away from this speech today, it is that phrase. There's no longer a separation between politics and business. In the words of Martin Luther King, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. From Larry Fink of BlackRock to UK CEOs, a number of companies have spoken out on the back of the Black Lives Matter movement. Some have announced special schemes, others have said they're looking in you at their recruitment. 
those that haven't spoken out are probably making a mistake. We live in a world now where silence, silence is not really enough. Take a look at the demonstrators and those who've spoken up on social media. They're all colours, including lots of whites. And if you think about it, a larger proportion of a company's, of all companies' workforces are now made up of millennials and Generation Z. And they care. They care about the world. And they want to work for companies that care about the world and that are seen to care. They look for a work and life alignment where they can be the same person at work and at home. Now, I want to talk about diversity and inclusion as part of this, but let's just look at it rather like one looks at uh, environmental and social governance. ESG, which used to be in that office in the back somewhere. Nobody paid attention to it except once a year. Well, the environment is no longer once a year. You know, if you think about it, Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, he first highlighted the financial risk from stranded assets like coal mines from companies that invested in companies that had coal mines, coal mines, for example. And of course, there are also opportunities, opportunities in renewables, opportunities in making a transition. I'd say similar in a very similar way to ESG. Diversity inclusion is now central because it's about two things. It's about risk and it's about innovation. Risk and innovation are going to get us out of this, out of this coronavirus crisis. That's really what's going to do it. And to make the sort of best decisions, to make the best possible decisions and to mitigate risk, we need diverse, diverse opinions which are encouraged and listened to. And that's very important, the second half of that sentence, encouraged and listened to. And so on the back of that, actually, um, because that's where I think the world is going, I'm the co-founder of the Inclusion Initiative, which is the latest institute at the London School of Economics, where I'm a governor. And I'm doing this with Professor Grace Lorden, using behavioural science and data to improve, well, we believe it will improve innovation and the bottom line. So we're in conversation with a number of professional um, and financial firms to talk about being partners in this endeavour. And do please get in touch if you, uh, if you might be interested. A few last words on people. Communication and collaboration are key skill sets. Empathetic leadership and the ability to understand what is driving your many different stakeholders is something that no leader can do without. I um I was recently talking to Antonio Simoes. Antonio is the new CEO for Europe at Santander, and he was the head of global private banking, had a global private banking at HSBC till recently. And he talks about, you know, his leadership has always been very empathetic. And everybody has always said, oh, that's your Portuguese blood. And he said, and people sort of teased him a bit about it. And in this crisis, it's proved, it's made his team work together much better because they know more about each other. They've been more open about their emotions, their feelings. Um, this may not sit comfortably with many of us, but it is the new way of leading. Build back better is a phrase I presume you've heard, build back better. Lots of great alliteration there. I think understanding the impulse behind it, the desire to change the world, and that's that's going to affect the future of companies. So we've talked about people, although everything really is about people, but now let's talk about the audit committee, which is numbers, really, numbers, resilience. Now, resilience in the financial crisis, the banks were bailed out by the governments, each bank, you know, the banks in each country. The regulators then forced them to increase their capital and the regulators have been working on changing their culture. That's why we're not facing a financial sector crisis yet. Even though, you know, our economy has been turned upside down. 
but companies companies have been run in an efficient way. So you cut costs the minimum, carry as little capital as possible, get that return on equity up. That model, I think, is finished, and it comes back to the notion of risk, the big risk, the big black swan events we face now. So there are two reasons, I'd say, for why that model is finished. So one is, yeah, the black swan. We need more cash. Companies need more cash. They can't run on last minute. They've got to have cash or cash equivalent. They need more capital sitting there. The amplitude of events is that, is the reason for that. The second reason that model is finished is that this idea that you can cut costs to the minimum by treating employees as contractors or outsourcing to India and then focusing excessively on shareholders. This model was already discredited and now it turns out it's a very risky one. One bank CEO I was talking to, she mentioned that um, a lot of her outsource work in India, the outsourced um, functions in India, was a major problem because the employees could not work from home. They didn't have the internet access, they didn't have the capacity in terms of the family. All of a sudden, and of course, the truth of the matter is, and this is what's going to happen more and more, automation is going to take over. Government and regulators will be much more involved in the private sector than they were before. We've talked about that. And what they're going to do is they are going to ask for different things. Um, if you, I mean, for example, and we don't even have this from the government, this is from the private sector. The new stewardship code, for instance, it calls for more high quality integrated reporting. And that is going to be absolutely the most relevant thing for listed companies and for a number of, of non-listed ones. Now, costs still need to be cut, and automation, as I mentioned, will be there, robotics, AI. And, of course, having less of your workforce in the office. I mean, on average, it could end up being 30% less. It depends. Are you a tech firm? Are you a firm that depends on personal interaction a lot? You know, you're going to save on real estate costs, and this obviously has huge implications for the commercial real estate sector. But um, if you just take a look at Facebook, Facebook has offered every single one of its employees the ability, sorry, the, um, the right to work from home. Some will want to take it up, some won't. But a number of people have found that actually it's rather, it's rather an interesting proposition, and it will no longer be what it used to be, which was so-called flexible working, means you are a woman with small children, you're going to work from home, and you're going to be on the, you know, on the slow track to partnership or whatever. Um, that's no longer the case. In terms of um, audit, so I've talked about resilience, fraud. Fraud is going to be huge, absolutely huge. Look out for it. I presume accountants are more than aware that this is going to happen. Anecdotally, I already know about one private equity held company. It took uh, government furlough money in a month when it had no right to. When you have convulsions in funding, opportunities for misbehavior increase. So, last in the numbers, but probably a very, a very important area, taxes. Look out for windfall taxes on some of the corporate sector. Governments are desperate for funds. They will hit individuals. Uh, wealth tax, getting rid of the vestiges of the non-DOM regime, increasing income taxes. They can't raise VAT because they want to get consumption going. So where are you going to get those funds? I mean, you're borrowing, but you are going to have companies in their crosshairs and they will be shooting right at them. Now, I hope, and perhaps this is more hope than reality, this crisis will lead to the proper taxation of the Googles and Amazons of this world. 
and maybe not just taxes. You know, Elon Musk, um, Elon Musk of Tesla was recently calling for the breakup of Amazon. You're ending up with, I mean, we have these huge monopolies and they have great lobbying and they don't get broken up. But if nothing else, the one of the things I've been thinking about is the the sort of need for higher taxes. Partly we've seen it from coronavirus, but it could be the biggest push comes from the employees of Facebook, of Twitter. It's far fetched as a theory, but if you remember in 2018, for instance, 20,000, 20,000 of Google's employees walked out in protest at their company's handling of sexual harassment. That is an incredible number, and it comes back to the idea of people, people who care and people who want to change their companies. Most of us, of our generation, you just took what came and you didn't try, and if you're going to try and change the world, you did that outside the office. I think it's happening now inside the office. Let me conclude now, and I'm going to give you a little, a little story, a little anecdote. In 2015, a client for my, for the Robinson Hambro CEO advisory services, he was the executive chairman of a bank and he asked me to give a talk to his global advisory board. My theme in 2015 was that globalization had peaked. Very prescient, if I may say so, because this was before Trump and Brexit. Um, in case you think I have a crystal ball, can I also tell you that I also predicted Putin, President Putin of Russia, was on the way out. In fact, he's going to stay there forever. Um, you can't win them all. But the point of this story perhaps is that we can't predict the future. But executives and non-executives, they can consider trends and responsibilities within boards, within the risk committee, the nominations and remuneration committees, and the audit committee, and act accordingly. May I now thank you all for listening. And now the fun bit for me, of course, is uh, your comments and questions. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Karina. Um, it is a, a real delight to hear such an erudite uh, talk, uh, not least uh, uh, from a fellow LSE person. It's a real privilege to hear all of that. Uh, you've raised a number of interesting questions uh, for the, from the audience, and so I'll just get cracking if I can. Um, Bob McDowell's dialing in from Alderney, and he's asking, there's a difference between recognizing risks and active financial management of risk. Uh, do financial institutions have to increase their budgets further for risk management in the future? Your thoughts on that? Absolutely right, Bob. I mean, I presume what your question is really, it's rhetorical. You think they should, and I think they should. I mean, I think we need to set aside more funds for the unexpected. Imagine, you know, if you were running a company now and you had actually been more risk aware and you had put more importance on risk, you would have more funds to deal with what's happening at this very moment. And I think that's the way the whole future is going. Now, it's very difficult because so many of these risks, you cannot compute them exactly, especially the ones I've been talking about, you know. Um, so I'm not sure it, it relies on a change in the uh, culture of a company. And it relies on people like you saying that this is what we need to do. Uh, Ian Harris is writing in, fascinating talk. I find it hard to reconcile the people power point you made, for example, the 20,000 Facebook workers leaving voluntarily, and the large rise in unemployment figures, which isn't going to go away soon. Uh, traditionally, high unemployment has previously always put the biggest boot on the boss's feet. Uh, how do you reconcile those two thoughts? The people who are unemployed are not the professionals. The people who are unemployed are generally those who don't have the ability to retrain, to have other skills, to be entrepreneurial. You know, we're living in a world now, I mean, firstly, I do think the boot has been very much on the boss's um, side. And I think we've, you know, and I, 
I am, you know, I am a boss in that sense. I think we made a few mistakes. We made a few mistakes about globalization and how, you know, all these people who worked in factories were going to be retrained. And the government did some great stuff there. But the incentives and the ability to move, because it's also about moving from different regions, um, people power is within, I think it's within and generally, if you look at things like the Facebook um, employees, the Google employees, these are university graduates, and they have a great sense of their own. I think, firstly, they need less money, a lot of them. The importance of money has decreased, even though you know they don't have anything, these new generations anyway. They don't have enough money to put a, a payment, down payment on a house, whatever. But they've also, because of that, they put less um, emphasis on it. You know, if you have the latest car and you're 25, well, for our my generation, um, and I'm 56, so that's, you know, that sort of places it. Having the latest car at 25 was so cool. Now you have the latest car. No, it's not. Sorry. But you've helped launch an app that has brought water to 20,000, 200,000 villages in some area of the world where they didn't have clean water. You are a hero. So the world is very different. But I think that people power is so far not from the unemployed. Mm. But will it be? You know, demonstrations, I should see, I can see a lot of demonstrations happening and they're from people who won't have any power. I think as well, you, you raised a good point uh, about the uh, guaranteed minimum income uh, or universal basic income. In fact, I think in our warm up, you mentioned or pointed out that was uh, one of my favorite authors, Kurt Vonnegut wrote about that in, was it 52 in that great book, Player Piano. Uh, in fact, I gave a lecture on this about 15 years ago. Uh, and at the time, all of this seemed wild and crazy. But of course, this would also change the balance of power amongst the unemployed as well. Uh, and of course, make them uh, potentially more amenable to what the government uh, is trying to promote. So interesting points there. Um, moving on to that theme of big government in the warm up, you and I were uh, just chatting and I said, uh, you know, that I, I had some concerns about the obligations being increasingly put upon businesses. And you alluded in your talk, well, you said very clearly that you saw the boundaries between politics and business uh, disappearing or, or, or becoming much less. And my problem is you're trying to run a business and everybody wants you to be aware of everything all around the world. You're supposed to be aware of everything to do with uh, human rights, uh, social issues, where your coffee beans are grown, where your tuna comes from. Uh, where the child labor is, and these things are not being fed through the economic system. Uh, and I'm sort of curious if you have a comment on on that, because you know, to me, in an ideal world, and I, we don't live that, but in an ideal world, I wouldn't have to make these decisions because they'd be embedded in the economic decisions I make. In other words, uh, badly farmed tuna would, or sorry, not bad, badly fished tuna, uh, would just cost me more and I wouldn't buy it and therefore it would go out of business. Uh, are we asking too much of business? We have a job to do. You're absolutely right, Michael, in that we are asking too much of business. We absolutely are. And you cannot be on top of everything. You know, you miss one social media post that you're meant to make about one issue. And next thing you know, your employees are on strike or on social media, you've been attacked to the point where you've got to step down. I mean, we're, I, I do believe that companies have given up believing in different stakeholders. And I'm not saying all companies, um, but I'm saying there was this idea that business should stick to business. And that's something that actually isn't true. But having to be responsible for everything, you know, in your canteen, where does the food come from? It's, it's all good. It's all too much, but that's the way the world is going. And maybe there will be a way of, I don't know how one can deal with it, except by being much more aware and just realizing that this is a major risk. And that's also why I think boards, the risk committee, I would say it's the most interesting to committee to be on at the moment. Most overwhelming, but definitely the most intellectually interesting. 
Yeah, I, I must say, I, I wonder myself that you know, arguably the thing to do is competition means that I might thrive if I throw off all the baggage, but the worst place to be is to kind of take on only half the baggage. Uh, anyway, um, Hugh Purser continues sort of on this theme. Uh, companies can take a decision to increase their cash levels to prepare for future shocks, but they will need the support of their shareholders to do so. Uh, you know, is, is there a limit, therefore, to how far companies can go it alone? It's a very good point, Hugh, because you need your shareholders to buy into the story. And going back to the leadership you need, I talked about collaboration and communication. How do you communicate? You're going to have to communicate that. And the CEO and the top executives have got to understand the message and be able to communicate it properly. Um, I mean, I think shareholders, you know, we've, we've had these talks about, um, how terrible that, you know, shareholders only look at short term, um, quarterly results and that forces companies to be short term. But then fund managers are judged short term. And so the whole system has been a bit of a problem, a very vicious circle. I think, I mean, I'm hoping that this will lead to a reassessment. And if nothing else, there is a very good narrative behind why there has to be a change. And maybe that is a narrative that one can communicate. I mean, shareholders are going through this right now. They're the ones who are not getting those dividends. But I would think a number of them, you'd rather that at least, you know, the company was solvent and you had no dividend from it than anything else. Not a great choice to have to make, but that's that's the world we live in. Um one of our regular listeners, Jane from West London, is wondering what you think about the emergence of AI and the way that seems to be changing the ways professional work is done, the work is done, and eating into employment in many professions. Any quick thoughts there? Beyond There's a very interesting um, book written um, about how, now, I'm just going to get it since we are at home. You're going to give me one second. <laughs> uh, these are the virtues of webinars. <laughs> it's Directly called, to your library. let me go, Human Machine, written the future of our partnership with machines, written by Daniel Newman and Oliver Blanchard. And it talks about how it's a color of collaboration between the two. And I think we've seen that in that so much AI, it lacks what I would call common sense at the moment. At the moment it does. And that's why, and the biases that are in it because of what we push um, as human beings, the information we've fed in. At the moment, AI needs a lot of human input still. So we work in collaboration. You know, looking out 20 years from now, um, yeah, what can I say? I'm not sure a lot of these professionals I talk about are really, that's why continuous learning is incredibly important because whatever your job is, AI can probably take a lot of it away. So just keep on learning, keep on doing courses. Um, and that's probably the best way to guarantee employment for yourself. Okay. Um, in the time available, which is only about three or four minutes, I'm, I'm going to pick up uh, three final uh, kind of questions, all very much along the theme of how you see this future relationship between business and government working. Uh, so the first one is from Michael Cooper, uh, who compliments you on an excellent wide ranging presentation. But how do you actually see government, private and plural partnerships? manifesting themselves. Are there really any good examples, uh, if not here, overseas? That's such a good question, Michael, because, you know, where you see good examples, places like South Korea, but that's a totally different model. It's rather like, you know, when somebody says to you, we really should use the Swedish model or the Danish model, and I would think small Scandinavian countries are not relevant to how you run a country like the UK or how you run the US or whatever. And maybe what I'm saying is that Asian countries have done it better, some of the dragons. I don't know whether we can imitate some of that because I think it's where we unfortunately have to be at the moment and for the next few years. So maybe we could learn some lessons from them. That's the most I can really I can really say to you. Okay. Well, uh, turning to you know your constituency, uh, bankers and other financial institutions, 
Uh, what would you be your comment on financial institutions uh, that, that think they might want to retrench to specialization and segmentation as a way to manage the risks more effectively, sort of almost bowing out, I guess, is the idea here uh, from this wide range of issues that uh, a universal bank or universal, uh, the old, uh, what was it, uh, uh, the, the bank assurance uh, yeah. uh, model implies? I don't think you can. I mean, I think either you already are a niche player or, um, I mean, you know, Barclays and its investment bank, you know, its investment bank has sort of become smaller and smaller. RBS the same. Uh, so, you know, in a way it's happening already, but there was a reason for some of that. And let's try and remember back then, the idea was if you had different businesses, it was it was a more secure thing because if one business was going badly, maybe another one would be going well. Mm. So I don't know, you know, well-run bank Santander still does a lot. I mean, it is very much a universal bank. But what's so interesting about it is it's all over different countries. Well, in this pandemic, you know, that hasn't been a great, um, it hasn't been great, uh, great assurance against risk. So I don't think there is one model. I think it's how well you run your bank, but also, you know, the truth of the matter is government is going to have a lot to say about who you lend to and how you lend, and you're going to have to accept that. But I wouldn't be investing in any bank at the moment. How can you possibly have a decent return on equity when you've turned into a utility? Yeah. Uh, well, and, the, and then kind of a, an interesting theoretical point, Bob McDowell again uh, comes back with, surely we need more consistent government rather than bigger government, uh, or, or do you think that's an unlikely prospect? Leadership, you know, where are the leaders? Where are those who are willing to stand up, take unpopular decisions for the long term? Hmm. You know, we have a problem with our democracy, Bob, and I don't have the answer. But everything is too short term. Everything feeds into itself. That whole circle of, oh, my poll numbers have gone down, so I better do something else. Um, and that's why part of our risk is there. You know, could we, if you could have the sort of Singaporean or Danish government where they do try and think long term, but there's a different mentality there. We live in the world we live in and Maybe new leaders will come up, but at the moment, I don't think we've got any of them. Except, actually, interesting, some of the female leaders seem to have done rather better in the coronavirus than uh, than the male ones. Very true. Um, and just a final uh, kind of I'll toss you something, and maybe you can use this to uh, to make a closing uh, comment. Um, a lot of what you talked about were what I might call ignored knowns, um, and at the moment, it's very trendy to say, ah, well, because of coronavirus, which was a, an ignored known, we've got this other largely ignored known climate change. Uh, we in Long Finance were writing it. You mentioned uh, the Bank of England's work on financial instability and assets. And that actually came out of Long Finance in 2006, in case you weren't aware. Uh, it was we asked the question, burn it all back then. Uh, we also, you mentioned quantum computing. We've been writing on that since the late 90s. Uh, and in fact, have a webinar coming up on it next week. So uh, uh, I don't think we try and ignore uh, knowns. Uh, but uh, as I look at this, you've raised a couple others. I loved your comment about fraud. That's also an ignored known. And then the secondary effect of what is going to happen when governments wake up to the scale of fraud that's occurring on programs that they're trying to make uh, to, to be beneficent. So that'll be another issue. Uh, you mentioned, and I don't think people fully appreciate uh, universal benefits. So and where that that could take us. So a lot of ignored knowns out there. Uh, how can we get businesses, uh, particularly in financial services, to face up to some of these ignored knowns? I would say that, you know, there is no simple answer, Michael, but one of the things is diversity of thought. Hmm. I mean, it comes back to my point about how to avoid groupthink, you know? Make sure you have new people coming in. Make sure they're diverse. Um, Royal Bank of Scotland under Alison Rose has done something very interesting where they've had, they have young boards. They bring some of their most promising people together and put them into a board and they get to see some of the board papers. 
they get to actually and you get their input, which is very, very different from what the main boards is. You may choose to ignore what your young board is saying, but it'll certainly wake you up and make you look at different issues. So I would say, actually, the answer is diversity and inclusion. Well, there I, I have to fully support you. Diversity of thought is one of the, the most important things to get and one of the hardest things to get right. And hopefully we'll have you back to talk about that, particularly as your center at LSE uh, takes off. Uh, I know it's underway and we're looking forward to more from that. So please feel free to contact us to come back on that. Sadly, uh, we've run out of time. And before I uh, come to thank you, Karina, if I might, I need to thank our sponsors again uh, because they are wonderful, uh, tolerant, open to diversity of thought people. So thank you for allowing us to uh, explore uh, an interesting area about the future. And please do contact us if you would like to talk about sponsoring events or bulletins or things yourself. Uh, I would like to point out as well as ever, uh, whilst thanking you, the audience, that there are more webinars coming up. An intriguing one uh, and one that I think is going to be fascinating is tomorrow. We're going to be hearing from Nur Sultan about their work on green finance. And so from all those people who sort of throw uh, their hands up and claim that Outside of Europe, there's no green finance going on. This should be fascinating. We're also going to talk with Marcus Treacher of Ripple. And on Friday, we're going to have a fascinating look at the investability of healthcare um, around the world. So uh, a lot, a lot coming forward. But it really uh, remains to me, if I might, Green, it to say thanks to you on behalf of the audience. It wasn't just erudite, but it was also candid. I loved your admission about your. Uh, Putin predictions, uh, and I myself am guilty many times of having forgot about predictions that didn't work out and remembering all the ones that did. So well done you for being so candid about it and exploring uh, the diversity of thought that you have within your brain. So <laughs> it was a real it was a real privilege. Um, I'm afraid in this modern era of uh, webinars, it's very difficult to get the audience uh, all off mute to clap you, but I might uh, celebrate with a uh, a little uh, celebratory. Uh, knock here from the audience. So, uh, Karina, <laughs> if I might, I'd just like to say thank you so much uh, for appearing with us. And we look forward to staying in touch and perhaps uh, well, hopefully having you back on uh, sometime soon. So, My pleasure, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Take care, everyone. Bye.